This episode of the Trek Geeks podcast is brought to you by the Trek Geek Shop. Now you can help support our show and get yourself some cool Star Trek gear at the same time. Check out our line of t-shirts, mugs, hats, and other items for your inner Trek geek at shop.trekgeeks.com. Hi, this is Kim Stinger, Lieutenant Uhura on Star Trek Continues. All hailing frequencies are now open for the biggest little show this side of the Alpha Quadrant. It's the Trek Geeks Podcast with Dan Davidson and Bill Smith. Biggest little show this side of the Alpha Quadrant. Welcome, one and all, to the Trek Geeks Podcast, then episode number 82. Wow, 82. Wow, take that, Hinman. I, um, I'm Bill Smith, your co-host. We're all so glad you're here. Thank you for downloading, and thank you for listening. It's at this point I'd like to bring on my esteemed co-host. You might recognize him. Some might say he resembles the reanimated corpse of... Tellerite and Nausicaan body parts. He's the Frankensteinish Dan Davidson. Dan, welcome aboard, buddy, and happy Halloween. Uh. <laughs> That's all I got. Okay. That's yeah. all I got. Happy Halloween. Yeah, Halloween night as we record. You know, there's going to be some weird stuff going on. Because that's my virtue of the fact that you showed up. You beat me to it. You didn't let me finish my sentence. You took a breath. I did. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's great to be here as always. Uh, thanks for that great introduction. You, you know, I'm not even sure what the best part of the podcast is at this point because those introductions got to be right up there. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I've only ever repeated one of them. Only ever? Yep. Okay. I, I can go with that. Do you remember which one it was? No, I don't really listen to you very much, so I don't know. It's the one where I said you were a uh, former Montgomery Ward underwear model. Oh, so you talked about the the truth twice. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's that's what I'm going for. Okay, sure. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, Dan, uh, we have a great show on tap today. We're going to talk a lot about some seconds in command. Oh. Let me tell you something, brother. It's going to be an incredible Thunderdome. All the first officers, it's going to be great. And what you going to do when the first officers come for you? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if you continue to do that. We might be sued by the remains of Gawker. I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's going to be fun. We've been talking about this one for a long time also. Uh, the ultimate uh, showdown for all of the number ones. It should be pretty awesome. I agree. I'm looking forward to this discussion. We, I, I have no idea where you're going to go in your direction. I don't think you have any idea how I'm going to go in mine. So uh, this should be fun. It's just like any other day, then. Hey, what do you know? Okay. Well, Dan, just like any other day, why don't you tell everybody listening how they can get in touch with us and tell you how much you smell like a Nausicaan. Wow. Well, okay. Uh, probably everybody knows that, but on Twitter, Facebook, and Skype, our handle is Trek Geeks. Uh, you can send us an email at trekgeeks at starfleet.com, or you can call us at 508-784-1701 and leave us a voicemail. Also, you can go to speakpipe.com slash trekgeeks and leave us a message that way as well. Uh, you can join our official Facebook group, Facebook group called Camp Kittimer. Uh, always great discussion as always. A lot of uh, new members, some great comments there recently, some great Halloween picks uh, to get uh, onto the group. Just go to facebook.com slash groups slash Camp Kittimer. And uh, we're going to give you a gift if you join Camp Kittimer. Did you know that, Bill? We are? Yeah, we're going to give everybody early access to the Trek Geeks podcast just for being a member of Camp Kittimer. So go right over and, uh, and join up. Uh, but please remember... Please remember that any comments or messages that you leave us in any of these places may be used in a future episode. Bill? 
Thank you, Dan. Dan, I'm being handed a very urgent note from the newsroom. It says that this here podcast is now the 1,066th favorite podcast of one Adam Drosen. My God, we are moving up. We're, actually, but we're the number one of Haley's, so that's good, too. Actually, we dropped like a rock. Oh, we did. We, Why? We're down from like 300 to 1,000. What, what did you do? What did I do? What did you do? I um, Adam, Adam, I'm going to appeal to your good side right now. Um, Adam, I've always loved you, man. Come on back. Bring us up. Bill's a jerk. What? <laughs> Dan, it's time for the news from treknews.net. <laughs> Batting the Alpha Quadrant. <laughs> What the hell was that? It was like an explosion of news. <laughs> I don't I have any idea what I'm looking for. I need a minute. <laughs> we got news, man. We got an explosion of news from the Alpha Quadrant, like a Borg cube in Earth orbit. <laughs> well, I like that. How'd you like that? Was that good? Yes. Pursuit course, Mr. Hawk. Dan, first and foremost, probably the biggest story of the week. Oh. Looks like Brian Fuller has some time to kill. Yes, he does. Uh, This came as quite a shock, I think, to many people. Uh, Brian Fuller has officially stepped down as the showrunner for the upcoming Star Trek Discovery on CBS All Access. Uh, That was a a big announcement uh, in the middle of last week. they're very, uh, the, the CBS has said that they are extremely happy with the creative direction of Star Trek Discovery and the strong foundation that Brian Fuller has helped to create for the series. Uh, but due to Brian's other projects, he is no longer able to oversee the day-to-day of Star Trek, but he remains an executive producer and will continue to map out the story arc for the entire season. Interesting. Dan, are we both of the same mindset on this? Well, I don't he, know what your mindset is. That he <laughs> was pretty much fired. Yeah, I got to say I uh, I agree with that. Based on the articles, uh, treknews.net, of course, had a great story about it. Um, I, I'm thinking they made it very clear that he has other projects that he's working on, and he couldn't devote the time to this. To me, that translates into I've got more important things to do. So I'm not going to be able to give this my full intention. So CBS said, okay, we'll have somebody else do it. Thank you very much for coming. You know, I could be wrong, but... In politics, this is generally true, that when you see a press release that says somebody has stepped down or is going to pursue other interests, it's usually shorthand for they were canned. Mm. And that's kind of the way this one read to me. I mean, maybe that's not the case. I'm certainly not well-versed in Hollywood speak, but if I know anything about politics, I'm willing to bet that there was a little bit of that in pl- of you know at play in here. Yeah, here's how I, here's how I'm taking this. I'm not going to be one of the negative naysayers that, of course, exploded on social media the night that this came out. You know how much that drives me insane. I do. If this is what happened and CBS said, fine, we're going to find somebody else, that shows that CBS is vested in this project. They don't want somebody who's not going to be able to give it their full attention, and they want it to succeed. Would it have been great if Brian Fuller was still doing this? Yes, but I think that they have enough up their sleeve that they're going to be able to get the people to run it that will run it correctly, and we are still going to get a great product come May. I got my fingers crossed, but I am going to remain very positive about it. Well, let's look at the overwhelming positives that that go along with your statement. Nick Meyer, still involved. Yes. Kirsten Beyer, still involved. Mm -hmm. Joe Minoski, still involved. And they've all written Trek in one form or another before. Yep. So there is still a top-notch group of people associated with this, and I'm sure even others that we don't know yet. And I still think there's nothing to worry about. No, I don't either. I am getting excited for the time where they're going to start announcing cast. Um, they are, I believe they're going to start filming in a month or so. Isn't that correct? Uh, somewhere around there. So uh, there will be some announcements coming, and I think that will help 
to quell all of the, oh my God, the Star Trek sky is falling again, which we had to deal with last week. Yeah, I have to agree with you there. Dan, speaking of, um, oh my God, (laughs) it appears that xenomorphs are coming to the Star Trek universe. Say what? Yeah, I know. (laughs) Yeah. I'm very excited about this. Uh, we've talked about the possibility of having a uh, a discussion about uh, the IDW um, comic book line. They have announced that Star Trek The Next Generation is going to have an Aliens crossover comic book series entitled Acceptable Losses. What? <laughs> um, I'm going to read a quick uh, excerpt here from treknews.net. Quote, we're beyond excited to team up with Dark Horse for this unique miniseries, said IDW editor Chris Searcy. With Scott and David writing and J.K. handling art, the blending of the Star Trek and Alien worlds is guaranteed to be a fun, scary, thrill-a-minute ride. And for us recording on Halloween night, this is kind of a cool Halloween-like surprise. This is going to be pretty cool. I agree with you. I can only hope it turns out better than... The sequel to the original Alien, Aliens. <laughs> not my favorite movie. Yes, I know that is not your favorite movie. They've had some great crossovers over the years. Uh, they had a Star Trek Next Generation and Doctor Who, I believe, at one point. Yep. And also a Star Trek and Green Lantern crossover is coming out uh, this December. So we'll have some cool stuff to look forward to uh, before Star Trek V Aliens. I think that's the second Green Lantern crossover, maybe. Wow. Well, look at you. Uh, Maybe. I could have that wrong. I'm I'm not as well-versed on comics as perhaps I ought to be. Maybe we should do an episode on comics. Well, well, I'll I'll talk to my people about that. Okay. Let me know what they say. I'll let you know. Dan, lastly in news, and this isn't necessarily a news item, but an update on something we mentioned before on the show. This past (laughs) weekend, the trial of the century occurred on the (laughs) GNT show's 24 Hours of GNT and you you didn't <laughs> you weren't convicted but you weren't acquitted let's put it that way you know what the way i look at it man when you are on defense and you don't lose you win so i'm going to take it like that uh it was a great night a lot of laughs a lot of fun unfortunately uh, Mr. Fark was unable to attend. He got very ill. I talked to him the next day. Uh, we hope you're feeling better, Fark. But uh, since he uh, was too scared to show up, um, Five Year wow. Mission had their lap dog uh, honorary uh, band member talk for the uh, plaintiffs. And uh, I pretty much think that's what took care of everything on my side. What do you think, Bill? I'm sorry, lap dog? <laughs> Lap dog. Now, let me ask you a question. No, 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 I'm not done. <laughs> so, what really did it was that the judge said there wasn't enough evidence. Oh. That's really what did it. Basically, and it was I, one I sentence. I want to state uh. for the record oh, that at the end of the trial, yeah. you attempted to start singing the same song again, to which the judge threatened to haul you back into the courtroom. She said after the gavel hit the whatever she hit it with, that was it. No appeals, no nothing. So, Did you not hear her threaten to drag you back into court if you didn't stop singing? After she started laughing, yes. But did she say that, sir? It's irrelevant at this point, No, it's not. I see. It's only (laughs) irrelevant because you don't want to admit it. (laughs) I did start. I think it was because I was so overjoyed that um, we can still have this great relationship with Five Year Mission that it just kind of like popped out, and I and I did reel it back in really quick, and uh, I did say how the Farkisms will continue because Fark himself sent me a tweet saying you got to keep them going. So uh, we got the great relationship with Five. We're back on track. We've healed. I think it is. I think that's what it is, Bill. Um, but I do have a question for you as we What's wrap that? up the news. Now that the trial is over, are you still an honorary band member, or is that now nullified now that the C&D doesn't really have any place uh, to be enforced because the trial's done? Uh, that's not what the judge said. She didn't say it had no place to be enforced. That is up to the discretion of the band. I mean, if they vote as a unit that I'm no longer a member, then I will accept the will of the band and and be okay with it. So what you're saying is that you'll 
you'll just, you know, abandon me again. No. Is that what I you're saying? You, no. You what I you, didn't say anything that involved you. I was talking about the band. You traitorous. Disloyal. You stab me in the back the first chance you get. Get out. I never want to have to listen to you again. Are you done? <laughs> it you was fun done? though, wasn't it? We got to thank GNT. It was GNT was awesome. Uh, we had a great time. It was for a great cause, uh, and uh, we were thrilled to be part of it. You know, I have to say that you know the GNT show has been around for five years. I'm guessing because they're in like episode two fifty seven. Wow, jeez, they've been around for a long time and doing this longer than most people who do Star Trek podcasts. Mm-hmm. And they are, in my opinion, um, pioneers in that sense. And they are due every last bit of respect that is due them. Um, They were among the first podcasting about Star Trek, and we love them, and we wish them nothing but great things. Um, When I think of low-end podcasters, they are not Hmm. among them. And anybody who says that has no idea what they're talking about. I wonder who I could be talking about. Hmm. Let me send anyway, an email GNT about that. GNT show, we love you, we support you, and we can't wait to hang with you in Vegas again in, I don't know, 276 days? Just, Keep, oh, right on the money, 276. Wow, you are a smart man. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, it's time to draw nigh and prepare to enter the field of battle. Huh? Huh? What did Tim the Toolman Taylor show up? What the hell was that? <laughs> Dan, we're going to talk today about first officers, and we're going to talk about a whole bunch of aspects of them and maybe try to figure out which one of them might have been the best. The best of the best, because they're all pretty damn good. That's true. I mean, you know, our crews that we've been treated to have been the best that there is to offer. So that is true. Okay. So um, let's let's start here by reviewing the candidates we have for this job and maybe talking about the ones that we didn't add into the mix. Good idea. I like that. Start spitballing that. Spitball. Sure. We'll start with the original series, of course. Everyone's uh, Everyone knows that there would never be Star Trek without the first first officer, Mr. Spock. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Uh, he set the bar pretty high, I think, during the original series. Um, next, uh, Bill, we had Next Generation, I believe, is, is what we'd be talking about next. Allegedly, yes. yes. There we have um, the one and only... Commander William T. Riker. The T stands, of course, for Thomas. We're not going to be talking about Tom because he's sitting in a Cardassian prison. Oh. But um, yeah, whether bearded or baby faced, Riker <laughs> clearly was the right hand of Jean Luc Picard for seven plus years and then eventually went off to Captain the Titan. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Is that considered canon? What? The Titan. Yeah. It's a. Uh, Nemesis. That's right, from Nemesis, yes. I'm thinking the books, because there's so many books that I've read of Titan. That's correct. Okay. And then, Dan, in Deep Space Nine, we had a bit of a different situation. Yeah, we had the kick-ass first officer in Deep Space Nine, major or colonel, depending on what season uh, Deep Space Nine, uh, Kira Norris, former terrorist freedom fighter uh, for the Bajorans, uh, became Cisco's right-hand woman, and uh, she was uh, one tough cookie. Without a doubt. Yes, absolutely. And uh, then moving on to uh, a different quadrant, actually, uh, Catherine Janeway's first officer of the USS Voyager. Yeah, the best written character on that show ever. Akuchi Moya. We had uh, Chakotay. You know, of course, he was a, a maquis, you know, sort of a rebel, or I don't know if they, I don't know if they really qualify as terrorists per se, because Kira was a terrorist. Let's mm, be honest. That's true. But you know, they rebelled against Starfleet to uh, take action against things they believed were wrong, and Chakotay led a a maquis cell, if you will, 
and eventually wound up being first officer to the only star sh- Starfleet ship in the Delta Quadrant. I like it. And then, Dan, we travel back in time a bit for our last first officer candidate. Yes, Enterprise. Uh, T'Pol, first Vulcan uh, to be on a Starfleet starship, as it turns out. Not Mr. Spock, as we all thought for so many years. Uh, came aboard rather uh, not one of the things that she would rather be doing. I think she had other things she would rather be doing than being on Enterprise with humans. That smelled funny. Um, <laughs> but uh, there was a lot of growth in her character on the show, which I'm sure we'll get into during our discussion tonight. Well, um, nobody smells funnier than you, Dan. I think we established that in the intro. Yes. Nausicaan. Dan, there are a few first officers we're not considering this evening. Mm-hmm. And I'll go through the list. You know, it's pretty brief. Okay. Originally... Number one, and I don't mean Riker, I mean the part played by Major Barrett Roddenberry in The Cage. Yes. Uh, we figure that she's only around for one episode. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, not a lot to build off of for that. Um, so, yeah, we decided not to uh, to have her on the list. And then, technically, there could be a particular character considered first officer of the Defiant, but that's never really established, right? Yeah, uh, Worf was head of ops on Deep Space Nine, and then when they built the Defiant, he ended up living on the Defiant because he was more comfortable living on a starship. And I don't believe it was ever established that he was officially the first officer of the Defiant, although he acted as such uh, whenever Cisco was was on board and they were doing missions. But uh, we decided for continuity's sake with him being ops, uh, head of ops for the space station, that we would not include him in the first officer discussion. Yeah, it was kind of implied, but I don't think ever stated outright. Yeah. I'll have to check in. Yeah, it seemed weird that there would be two first officers, one for the station and one for the ship. Exactly. So so those are the parameters with which we're working. Um, We're going to go through some aspects of the first officer job talk about maybe who exemplified some of these characteristics best, perhaps, and we'll have some discussion. And Dan, let's start off with probably the first one that comes to mind. You figure an incredibly important job of the first officer is to advise the captain, Mm -hmm. you know, and especially in critical situations. Um, Is there one of those characters you feel did that better than the others? Yeah, I actually have two that I wanted to bring up, but the the one that I'm going to talk about first is the one that I is my overall pick for this, and that it has to be Spock for me. Uh, he was the one uh, that was always Kirk's standing by his side, Kirk talking, whispering in his ear about his thoughts and everything. He's just the person that I think of as the advisor to the captain. With all of these other ones, there's always some kind of, you know, maybe argument or or disagreement or something like that. But Spock always stood there and advised him as he saw fit logically as a Vulcan. And also the aspect of science officer, he brought that in very well with these discussions. So uh, Spock is my primary choice for this uh, particular aspect of the job. Very interesting. Mm. A, a great choice, obviously, because Spock is Spock. Mm. Yes. But, um, I went in a different direction. Did you now? I did. I actually chose Will Riker. And I say that because as as key as Spock is to Kirk, Spock also, more often than not, relied more heavily on his science officer position necessarily than his first officer position. Yes, he advised the captain, but more often than not, he also was relegated to that science officer role. And I don't mean that that was a downgrade. I mean, that's just who Spock was. Mm -hmm. When I think of pure advisor to the captain and, and how much that captain values that counsel, I for me, it, it kind of makes Riker stand out a bit because, of course, he was the first first officer to sit right at the right hand of the captain, if you will. True. And he was right there in the midst of everything, and it wasn't uncommon for Picard to get Riker's opinion. So that's kind of where I came in, came down on that. Okay. It's funny. You, you just mentioned you said something about exec. You know who we didn't include in, as not being in the list? Who's that? Will Decker. Um. He was first officer technically for a little while. Technically, <laughs> but it's almost in the sense that number one was in the cage. He was really True. there for one 
right. mission, if you will. Not really one episode. Sure. But he was captain who was demoted. So True. Um, back to the principal advisor to the captain. I said that I had another one that I actually put on the list. And this may surprise you a little bit. Yeah. But I actually wrote to Paul down for this. Really? I initially went with Spock. But I, I, I mean, I, I ended up going with Spock, but I, I was going back and forth between the two because although it was a very uh, difficult relationship at first, as the series went on, I felt that um, Archer depended on her opinion much, much more than we had ever seen before with captains and first officers. You know, it's interesting because remember in in the pilot or early on, he says he wanted to knock her on her ass, yeah. essentially. And in the finale, he even references that again (laughs) and talks about how valued she's become. Mm -hmm. So I can absolutely see why you had her in consideration. That makes sense to me. Cool. Nice. So, Dan, the second quality in the job description, implementing the captain's orders. It's one thing to advise the captain, but it's another thing entirely to carry out his agenda. Or hers. Or hers, that's correct. (laughs) And who would you say in this case did the best job of implementing the captain's orders? I think by adding that little uh, caveat to the end of your sentence might give you a hint of who I chose. Um, I'm not, no, I'm not getting it. I'm going to try to do my impersonation. Hold on. Captain. Yes. I couldn't understand most (laughs) of the things he said either. But I actually went with Chakotay on this from Star Trek Voyager. And the reason I did is because even when he was 100% against what the captain was doing, he implemented those orders. He may have said behind closed doors how much he didn't uh, think it was right, but he understood the role of first officer when it was given to him. uh, And he uh, was uh, exemplary at carrying out Captain Janeway's orders, I think. A good example is how he did not agree with what they did in Scorpion when they were going to go after the Borg. And he made it known to her that that uh, he didn't agree. And Janeway, that was the, line, the episode where Janeway felt that she was truly alone, as she said to Chakotay. But he carried out her orders. Perfect example of that. That's a that's a great example. And in all honesty, I actually also chose Chakotay. Nice. For many of the same reasons. I didn't cite Scorpion specifically, but Chakotay was not afraid to go to the captain and say, I think you're wrong. Yeah. But once they left that ready room, he was on the same page and he carried out just about every single order she had. Exactly. I do have to say as a runner up, I chose Major Kira for many of the same reasons. There are plenty of times where she disagrees with Cisco in Cisco's office, Mm -hmm. but she would eventually always carry out Cisco's orders because she trusted him. Whether as an officer or as the emissary, she still had that trust in him and carried out his orders as, as he intended. Right. I think the fact that he was the emissary made it easier for her to do that, even if she didn't really agree with it, because it eventually got back to her religion and how she felt about the position that he held with the prophets. I agree. And that's ultimately why she came in second for me. Cool. You know, I think that, you know, I, I think Chicote gets a bad rap. You know, forget about the various issues you and I have with Voyager. There is, at the core there, a really interesting character in Chicote. And those parts of those episodes where there was conflict between him and Janeway really added something to the layers of that character, I think. It did. And we've talked about it countless times now about how um, the writing is what handicapped the series most. And when 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 they were good at the writing, it was, it was amazing. But more times than not, the writing was bland or it didn't give any opportunity uh, for the actors to portray these characters that we would have liked to see them throughout the entire series. Agreed. So Dan, the next facet in our job description, our theoretical job description, if you will, is crew management and development. You figure one of the, the, the most significant jobs of a Starfleet first officer is to make sure the crew is doing what they're supposed to. And if they're not, 
to get them there. So looking at our, our five main candidates, which first officer do you think did the best job of that crew management and development? This was by far the hardest one for me to think of and to okay. figure out. I'm still not 100% positive uh, of my answer because I couldn't really think of lots of examples where we would see that happening. Uh, so I eventually went with Riker from The Next Generation because I think that is the show that allowed us to see the crew – interacting with each other more than any other series on a, not a personal level, but a, an off the bridge kind of level. Um, I think of lower decks possibly as the main reason why I pick Riker. Um, but that, this was a tough one for me, man. Yeah. This one was tough for me too. And for the longest time for me, Riker was leading the way. And then the other day I was thinking about this and, I thought about many of those same qualities that you just mentioned. And ultimately, I lean toward Chakotay. And really? so he's my pick for this. Yeah. Well, think about this. On Voyager, there's a, a blended crew, for want of a better word. There's Starfleet people, which is a world Chakotay knows well, having been in Starfleet. And there's a, a Maquis segment of the crew. And as the first officer, he's going to find a way for these two crews to work together. It's true. I mean, ultimately, it's Janeway's responsibility as captain because she made the decision, but he's the one that has to carry out the order. So one of the things that I think Chakotay does really well, and you touched on it you know, in, in talking about Riker just a, a minute ago, is that personal level. You know, because he can reach somebody on a personal level and work with them and get them to understand what he's looking for or what he wants or even diffuse a conflict. And I think ultimately that makes him a bit more versatile than Riker, but that's just, that's my opinion. Interesting. Also, if I remember correctly, it was Janeway's decision to bring the two crews together, but she made it very clear that it was his responsibility to get them to work together. Yes. Yeah. That's good. I like that pick, man. That's a good pick. Yeah. You know, I was actually surprised I went that way. You know, because you and I joke about a lot about Chakotay, you mm -hmm. know, the whole Kuchi Moya thing. Right. But, you know, it's if they had written this character well, it had the opportunity to do great things. And this is just another one of those aspects that I think they intended to do a lot with, but missed out more often than not. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah. So, Dan, the next of our attributes that we're going to consider is the ability to command. Obviously, of course, the first officer second in command of a starship. Whenever the captain's incapacitated or not aboard the ship, they're sitting in the center seat. Mm -hmm. So, buddy, who do you want in that chair? I, this one was this one was the easiest one for me, but I'm I'm willing to bet that you're going to go a different route than I did. I went with I think the most obvious route, and I went with Riker from Next Generation. We saw it happen several times during the seven-year run, uh, especially when Picard was taken over by the Borg. He became captain. Everyone looked to him uh, for the for to do the right thing. Uh, obviously, through the course of the series, he was given the opportunity to be captain on more than one occasion, not only on Enterprise, but on other starships. So he has that command ability. He has the respect of the crew. They look to him for the answers. He's confident in what he can do. Uh, so that was an easy choice for me, I think. I have to agree with you. Um, I, I'm just, uh, before I give you my pick, who did you think I was going to pick? I actually went with, I thought you might take Riker, but at the same time, I'm kind of leaning that you might choose Kira because of the strength that she have has. But I'd also would say that it's one I'm not 100% confident that you would choose because she sometimes leads with her heart more than her head. And that's not a good uh, attribute of a first officer. I don't even need to be here. Oh, God. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I did choose Riker. Okay. Um, you know, a couple, few weeks ago, we were talking about insurrection. It's probably one of my favorite Riker lines ever, and I don't think I have to say it because I think I know you know which one it is. We're through running from these bastards. Exactly. <laughs> you know, forget the manual steering column. Riker's the man. <laughs> yes. Um, 
and coming in a close second was Kira, and I have to say specifically Colonel Kira. Mm-hmm. You know, because she needs some of that that maturity and that seasoning that she gets later on. I mean, by the time she goes to Cardassia in season seven, she is, you know, I grant she's wearing a Starfleet uniform, you know, simply just to get there, but she personifies a great Starfleet officer, even though she's a member of the Bajoran militia. Mm-hmm. She's a very well-rounded officer at that point. She absolutely can and, ha- and has taken command. But I think you're right. I think there were times where, you know, sometimes her heart gets in the way and that causes her to second guess. Whereas Riker, yeah, he doesn't have that problem. <laughs> he just lunges <laughs> around. Hey, you you so, brought up you brought up a very good point with Colonel Kira, and I think that is very evident uh, in those episodes where they're hiding and she has to work with Cardassians who she obviously hates and they hate her, but she's able to reel it in and get the job done knowing that these Cardass- Cardassians want nothing more than to kill her. Uh, yeah. She does a great job of, of being an officer and being in command in those, I think it's two or three episodes where they're dealing with that. And then Garrick ends up killing himself. It's pretty cool anyway. <laughs> Spoiler alert. God, man. Sorry. Just act like you've been there. (laughs) Well, Dan, let's take a look at the last of our criteria in the job description. Okay. Clearly, one of the most important jobs of the first officer, especially in later Trek, is to command the away missions. Yes. And that's a significant part of what the first officer does. You know, assessing danger, making sure the you know, the right personnel are on the team. Mm -hmm. Who would you say was the best first officer when it came to away missions? I chose Kira for this. It was um, just right out front. I'm just going to say it. Boom, Kira. There we go. Um, And the main reason why I would want her uh, on these away missions is we said it before at the very beginning of the show. She kicks ass. She's, she is not afraid to fight. She was a fighter. She was a terrorist fighter. She knows how to, uh, to fight and be in battles. Uh, so that's the person that I would want. And I think that she's does a very good job of picking the people that you want on the away mission to help the mission succeed. How many times did we see in the original series, and I'm not putting down Spock when I say this, how many times did we see Ensign Redshirt or, or Lieutenant whomever showing up on the away mission and they end up just up dying anyway? Uh, that went away with with the later um, series and with Deep Space Nine, I think Kira was uh, very good at at uh, running those away missions. I have to agree. I mean, she was she was pretty lights out. I have to say, my pick, however, was not Kira. Okay. Um, in taking a look at the various first officers, I had to take a look at the person who I thought was the equivalent of the captain on the ground. Because to me, that's what the leader of the away team is. Mm-hmm. You know, he's responsible for every aspect of that part of the mission. I mean, ultimately, of course, the captain is responsible, but you know, the first officer is it when they're on the ground. Okay. And for me, that person has to be Riker. He's a very good first officer, isn't he? <laughs> he really is. I mean, you know, I think that early on in TNG, you know, I, I think we we probably poke a little more fun at him than perhaps we ought to have Mm -hmm. because he's got that bravado (laughs) that's sort of larger than life. Well, you mentioned the Riker walk a few times and (laughs) you know, he's got that, that attitude, but when it comes to being a well-rounded Starfleet officer, I really think that Riker has a lot of those qualities, uh, which kind of surprises me. Yeah, it does. And, and we'll get into some, um, more specifics later on as we're as we're talking about some other aspects but it is surprising that both of us picked him for several of these aspects or at least had him in strong consideration for it yeah because i thought i was gonna go spock 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 <laughs> That's exactly right yep. you know yeah absolutely we think a lock alike that really scares the hell out of very, me very very scary should concern everyone in the audience <laughs> i um Seriously, people, if you hear me talking in code, it's because I need help. Oh, wow. (laughs) Thanks, friend. (laughs) Welcome, buddy. (laughs) 
So, I mean, I don't want to, you know, say we've <laughs> we've already made our decision, but you know, which had the most major accomplishments as a first officer? Yeah, you this think one. About missions, you think about, you yeah. know, whatever. I uh, this is another one. I had to I had to choose William T. Uh, or uh, Will T. Thomas. I'm choosing Thomas. That's what I'm going with. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he wasn't first officer, so he wouldn't even be considered for this because he wasn't first officer when he got split. I think we covered that earlier. Yes, I know we did. Yeah, I'm going with Riker on this one. Obviously, um, I said it earlier. He had several promotions handed to him, which he turned down. So Starfleet knew that he was ready to be a captain. He had those major accomplishments handed to him. He was just smart enough to understand that being on the flagship was bigger and a bigger feather in his cap than being captain of a who knows what starship. So I chose Riker for for just the fact that he had several opportunities given to him. He was captain of the Enterprise uh, for a time, um, and he always uh, was successful in what he did. I almost went Spock on this one. Really? Well, think of some of the accomplishments of the original series crew. I mean, you know, Riker, sure, he saved the planet before, but the original series crew saved the planet many times over. Let's be honest. Here. Yes. There's the whole whales thing. Whales. There's the whole, um, you know, the Klingon. Klingons. Peace deal, you know, in the undiscovered country. Peace. Numer- <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <just> repeating <laughs> random words. <laughs> <laughs> so you know I, I almost went Spock and I, Riker probably nudges him out just the slightest yeah. bit yeah because there's that whole Borg thing it's not just a little thing uh, it's pretty big no I know yeah but yep. then I think about Kira and how Kira was Cisco's first officer during the Dominion War mm-hmm. and that almost you know changed the balance of the Alpha Quadrant forever right you know that's a fairly major accomplishment but helping to bring the Bajoran people into the Federation to play devil's advocate to that. Yeah. Riker did it basically with one ship and Kira and Cisco did it with a fleet or fleets, plural. Um, I'm not downplaying at all. We, we both just think the dominion war arc was, was some of the best writing ever. Um, I just would have to give Riker the, 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 um, extra extra points because he had little to work with and was able to do it. Okay, that's fair. I'll buy that. So let's change up our last couple of points because it sounds like we're both pretty settled on Riker. <laughs> so let's take Riker out of the mix for a minute. Okay. At the end of their respective television series, not counting movies, which first officer do you think could have been promoted to captain? I actually uh, did not have Riker in this list. Uh, okay. Of, when I when I chose, I had two. I had Spock because he did become captain, but we're not talking about the movies. Um, so I actually went with Kira uh, for a lot of the reasons that we've already talked about. Uh, she certainly proved herself as major Kira uh, during most of Deep Space Nine's run. But then when she was given that commission to be Colonel Kira... Uh, and was, for all intents and purposes, a Starfleet officer. She proved what she needed to do to get the mission done, and she literally, she pretty much was given command of Deep Space Nine in the final scenes of the series, and I think that she would have uh, made a great captain and should have been promoted to captain at the end of the series. That's a really good explanation. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I went in a different direction. I also did not choose Riker. Mm -hmm. I actually chose Chakotay. I knew you were going to choose him. Well, because I figured Janeway gets promoted to Admiral, which we find out about Nemesis. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, enough with the Janeway hatred. It's not. No, it's not Janeway hatred. Believe me. (laughs) No, I know. It's the the writing. (laughs) But. You figure that Chakotay very easily could have picked up right there and been the captain of that starship from there on in. Mm-hmm. And, and been an effective one and been a good one. 
So that's kind of my rationale for that. I I went with Chakotay over Kira for that. Can I? Can I uh, how we haven't had to Paul for any of these. I was just gonna say that it's, it's <laughs> like it's really too bad. I talked about her real quick at the beginning, but that's pretty much it. I do want to let you in on a little secret. It's not canon, but Chakotay is captain of Voyager in some of the novels. I had heard that. Yeah, yeah. So and that's I think cool. that makes sense. Yep. He knows the ship. That's for sure. Well. Do they bring Janeway back to those novels too? Uh, I don't really want to say what happens in the novels with Janeway. Okay. In case anybody wants to read them. All right. Well, <laughs> you already spoiled the fact that Chakotay winds up as captain. Yeah, that's a lot. nothing. Sure. That's no big deal. You just t- you just said he should be captain. Good Lord, <laughs> man. <laughs> all right, Dan. Well, let's stack rank them. So yeah. if you had to take all five first officers and rate them from you know number one to number five. Mm-hmm. What would your stack ranking look like? Well, before I give my list, I got to I got to give an explanation for one. I I like you thought a lot of the answers tonight with what we talked about was going to be Spock, 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 Spock. Yeah. But you said it earlier, and it's a very important part of this decision. He had to split his jobs more than anybody else did, so. It's it's tough to put Spock as the top first officer for that reason. It was very hard for me to do, but I did actually choose Riker first, followed by Spock, followed by Kira, Chakotay, and finally T'Pol. Wow. Was that bad? No, that's quite an admission <laughs> for you, though. About what, Spock? Yeah. Yeah, it was. It's because Spock is Spock. I mean, we've said it before. There's no Star Trek without Spock and Leonard Nimoy and what he did, and and he was such a uh, an integral part of the crew, and he did so much and everything through all the series, and then into the movies, and then into the new movies. He was such an important character. But as first officer, I have to look at it that way. We talked about all the different things that Riker accomplished and all the things that he did and how his style was and how he had the trust of the crew. I bet you there were some people on the original Enterprise who were, didn't have the trust of Spock simply because he was a Vulcan and he was that cold, non-emotional person. So people couldn't warm up to him the way that they could to Riker. So that that trust is a very important part of it also. Got to go with him first, man. I have to agree with you. I mean, he's at the top of my stock ranking, Riker, without mm-hmm. a doubt. Okay. And then, you know, the remaining four of the five slots looks a little different than yours. Okay. Um, and I'm kind of surprised at the way this played out myself. So I went Riker, Chakotay, Spock, Kira, and then T'Pol. Poor T'Pol. I love Jolene. I'm really sad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm separating out the the actors from the characters. Yeah. The sons. I mean, I love Jolene, too. Yeah. I love Nana. She's so wonderful. Yep. You know, I, I, I adore Leonard Demoy. I know you did too. Mm-hmm. You know, he means a lot to both of us. Right. But I have to look at that separately from the actual character and their role as first officer. Yeah. You know, I didn't think that Chakotay was going to be as high on this list as he was for me. And I'm that's very really surprised. the shocker. Yeah, very surprised at that. But you pointed out some very, very important aspects of the character of Chakotay as first officer during this discussion tonight that I never really thought about. So I don't, I'm not going to change my rankings, obviously, but I don't disagree with you, man. Let me ask you this. This is not on our outline, but I've kind of got a random question for you. Oh boy. Which, uh, leave Spock, you know, by the wayside for a minute, which of the remaining four first officers do you think could have been a good first officer for Kirk. Um, I wouldn't choose Riker for that. They're too much. They're too similar. Right. Um, I don't know if I would choose to Paul because then we'd be looking at the whole Vulcan aspect of it again. And I don't know if I want to go that route. Uh, you know what, man? Kira's too much of a hothead. Sometimes I think I would have to choose Chicote. Really? Looking at it really quick when you're putting me on the spot and we didn't have the outline, so I don't know what to do. Um, <laughs> I just, at, at quick bullet points, just like I said, uh, Kira, no, they get in too many fights. T'Pol's too much of a Vulcan. Riker, they're too similar. So Chakotay's the only one left. I actually went Kira. And Because why? I want someone who's going to push Kirk a little bit. You know, Spock is 
you know, that portion of, you know, clarity in Kirk's world. And it's, it's really kind of a luxury for him. Can't be Kira. Kirk's just going to sleep with her. Sorry, Vic. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, only season three Kirk. Oh, that that's right. That's right, 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 right. That's right. Um, but, you know, Kira's passionate. Yeah. Kira is amazingly strong. Kira is a Kira's a damn good officer. And I think that those are qualities Kirk would appreciate beyond anything else. I also think they'd butt heads from time to time. I think they would butt heads a lot. And don't you think that that brashness that she can have, I mean, the first episode, Emissary, I mean, the way that she is with, with, uh, with Ben, I, I just don't see Kirk putting up with that at all. Uh, certainly changes over the course of the series with them. But um, I just think that, you know, if you get off on that wrong foot, right away with Kirk, it's going to be very difficult to get back on the right foot. And it might be a little, uh, a little touchy. Well, possibly, but remember Kira ultimately winds up carrying out the captain's orders. Well, yes. I mean, they may have that relationship, you know, in council, but I think that ultimately, I, I, I think that she could work for Kirk very well, or at least make him stretch and grow as a captain. Do you think that, her being with Kirk and Kirk not being the emissary could be a problem for them working together. Because we talked about how it was probably easier for her to carry out the captain's orders, knowing that not only was he captain or commander of the station, but he was also the emissary of the prophets. There's that extra part of it for her. If Kirk's not that emissary, do you think it might be more difficult? Maybe, but maybe that's a journey they both have to go on. Hmm. That's very interesting. Yeah, see, it's the whole timelines aspect. Of oh, it. Gee, I was just going to say, we got to have some kind of like like video game, but we already do. <laughs> <laughs> so we have Riker wins. Wow. That really is something. You're going to have to take a special video of you doing your Riker gaunt uh, down the like the road or something to show the, the that he won or something. I don't know. <laughs> and then turn the corner. <laughs> We'll save it for Vegas. Yes. <laughs> Dan, speaking of Vegas, uh oh. Your personal friends, the band Five Year Mission. Oh. oh. You love them so much. I You're, love them more now. You love them more now. By the way, can I stop you for just a second? Uh, I have you a can. special announcement. Oh. I just had sent to me as we were discussing an official statement. From the judge herself in regards to the trial the other night. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Judge Janet has offered this statement. Solomonic justice was served in this defamation, infringement, domestic dispute, adjunct... Oh boy, I can't even say this word. Adjudicated? Adjudicated? Adju- thank you. Adjudicated in the Supreme Court of Star Trek, New England Circuit. I think it says it all right there. I know. I have no idea what it means. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we got. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if you should be as excited about that as you are. I am because I didn't get, I didn't lose. <laughs> I think we all lost a little bit, don't you? Well, I will say this. I will not sing five-year mission anymore. I will let the professionals deal with that because they are awesome and we do love them. And speaking of the professionals, we want you to head on out to fiveyearmission.net. Please download all their music. We truly can't thank them enough for having fun with Dan's little version of their Take a Ride song <laughs> and for also letting us use their music in every episode of the podcast. They're, they're phenomenal. We want you to love them as much as we love them. So please check them out and support them. We'd really appreciate it if you did. It would be awesome. Um, but I do have to say, even though I was on trial, Bill, yeah, it, I, I, I have to watch an episode every weekend. I love watching these weird alternate universe episodes that I found. Oh, this, no. You remember the Zindi arc on Enterprise? How could I forget? Oh, it was amazing. But I dug up this episode. Instead of our wonderful actress friend, Kipley Brown, playing the ghost of Ensign Jane Taylor, who Trip had to deal with, unfortunately... Or fortunately, depending on what side you're on, on the in the courtroom, uh, in this version we had this drummer dude playing the ghost of the dearly departed John Taylor, who tortured Trip endlessly with bad riffs. What can you expect though from the episode 
from Enterprise, The Fark Gotten. It's a classic, and I highly recommend it. Oh, dude. They, uh, that was that was terrible. What? <sighs> yeah. Oh, that's that was. Oh, I. Okay, I, I get it. Don't. <laughs> I need an adult. Oh, wow. And they're only going to get better from here, folks. Oh, here's hoping. <laughs> wow. <Okay. laughs> Dan, as you recall, our iTunes subscribe and review campaign is ongoing. We're in a new quarter. Yes. That means anybody who submits a review from now till the end of 2016 can qualify to win a prize. Anybody? Anybody who's not named Dan Davidson or Bill Smith. Oh, all right. Okay. Well, that's good for them. Well, Dan, what is that prize? I don't know. I think it's like $25 at Amazon or something like that. You sound a little more excited about <laughs> this. It's $25 from Amazon or whatever monetary $25 is if you're not in the United States. That's, <laughs> I suppose not to put too fine a point on it. That's close <laughs> enough. Yeah. I don't have the I don't have the copy in front of me, man. You don't need it. We've been doing it plenty of times. <laughs> I still don't know the phone number without looking at it. <laughs> I, I'm aware. <laughs> I think everybody in the in the audience knows the phone number except for you. That's one seven oh one. That's the only part you know. I wonder why. <laughs> so for more details about the iTunes subscribe and review effort, please hunt out the Trek Gakes. Trek Gakes? Trek tra- Trek Gakes. Yes. TrekGeeks.com slash iTunes. That'll give you all the details. Really, it takes no time at all. And you could win 25 bucks. How great is that? That's pretty awesome. 25 bucks is pretty good. And you can get a lot of stuff at Amazon for 25 bucks. You really can. Yeah. Dan, please regale us with the topic of our next episode. Well, Bill, I like you. No, you don't. And I wish to go on liking you. I will talk to you about what you talked with me, discussing for all eternity about the number one villain in Trek history, Khan Noonien Singh. Khan Noonien Singh. Dan! That sounded so much better when I was writing it. Yeah, it really did. <laughs> but yes, we are going to talk about the number one villain in Trek history on most everybody's list. We're going all con. We are. It'll be part history lesson, part discussion, and maybe part argument. We'll see. Okay. Yeah, That's con <laughs> next week on Trek Geeks. Dan, for more great Star Trek discussion, we of course want everyone to check out the Tricorder Transmissions and our friends over there. They are online at the TricorderTransmissions.com. And of course, Dan, for all the latest news on everything Star Trek, we want everyone to visit TrekNews.net. However, for now, this has been episode 82 of the Trek Geeks podcast. We do hope you all live long and prosper. Ready? Sure. Co-car nut. What? Co-con... Con nut? No? That was bad. <laughs> you mean like con, like yeah. con you can sing, or karn? Karn. Like Ka- fan film that's never going to get made. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Wow. I got to wow. go find some emails. I'll see you later. All right. <laughs>
face is the context. You should bleep that out all the time. Wow. Yeah, I said it. Why are you so angry? I'm not angry. It's 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 a happy day. It's Halloween. You know what we watched right before I came up to record? <laughs> no. What? It's the great pumpkin Charlie Brown. <laughs> Did so you get any great. trick or treaters? No, we actually because we have the dogs. Um, now that we have the fence around the yard, the only door is kind of open to the whole floor. And so the dogs would be available to get to the door and they will be freaks. So wow. we just, we had dinner downstairs. We, um, we used to, uh, in years past, we would get like 150 trick or treaters, but this year we didn't, we didn't do it. We had, you know how many we had last year? No. Zero. <laughs> you know how many we had the year before? Um. One. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's not a it's not the neighborhood for for trick or treating anymore. So we just decided just to put our jack o' lanterns out and uh, turn the lights down and go have dinner downstairs and watch It's a Great Pumpkin. And I do have to say something about It's a Great Pumpkin. You're gonna want to go and watch this now. You know why? No, because at the very beginning, when Linus and Lucy are bringing the giant pumpkin into their house, and Lucy stabs it with the Michael Myers knife and starts uh, throwing the guts out on the floor, the floor is almost the exact pattern of the sick bay sheets in the original series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, ways you can tell you're a giant Star Trek nerd. <laughs> Everything looks like the sheets in sick bay. Yep. There are so many mistakes in that cartoon, but it's so fun to watch. Are you clicking something on your end? Oh yeah, sorry. I got to put that down. That's my nervous habit. <laughs> yeah. It's a good was, show. It's fun. I always thought your nervous habit was breathing. Wow. No, my nervous habit is listening to you, and I get a tick, and I start having Tourette's. That makes no sense at all. I know it doesn't. You drive me crazy. Me. You. Oh. oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. I don't like you. I, well, guess what? I've always loved you. Yes, that's exactly right. Because if it wasn't for you, we'd never even be here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all thanks to you, Dr. Cochran. <laughs> Looking at the stars. <laughs> I don't want a statue. <laughs> I'm not detecting any leak. <laughs> leak. Don't you people from the future ever pee? Oh, right. Leak. That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. 